Okay. I think folks are just waiting for um, Council Member White to log back on. Chris, can I just do a mic check with the chair? Thank you. Mr. Chaco, is that okay? <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. It is I am Mayor Jonathan Judd. The Moorhead City Council is holding its regularly scheduled meeting using virtual meeting technology under an emergency declaration due to COVID-19. I am in the city council chambers <clears throat> along with individuals. Uh, Madam uh, City Clerk, will you just give a brief overview of who's currently in the uh, chamber and who's uh, online regarding uh, staff? So in chambers, I have City Attorney John Shockley, Community Development Director Christy Lashevsky, uh, IT Director Chris Ratty, and on the phone we have City Manager Christina Volkers, Assistant City Manager Dan Molly, and DMI Executive Director Derek LaPointe. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> Any public comment received prior to, to this meeting will be read as a part of the record during the applicable agenda item. The public may participate during the meeting <clears throat> by calling 218-299-5001. Public input will be taken by a staff member and provided to me to read during the meeting. Or you may request that your call be bridged to the virtual WebEx meeting and speak directly during our public hearings or citizens addressing the council agenda item. Again, the public comment line is 218-299-5001. If there is not an answer, please leave your message or callback number and we'll get back in contact with you. That being said, we'll call the meeting to order. And Madam Clerk, if you'll please initiate a roll call, please. <clears throat> My bad. Shelly Dahlquist. Here. Sarah Watson Curry. Here. Shelly Carlson. Here. Heidi Durand. Here. Deb White. And for the record, uh, Council Member White uh, is present. Uh, she was present at the beginning. We might have some Councilmember White, are you uh, online now? The record should reflect that uh, she is listed as a participant uh, on the WebEx screen. However, uh, we may have some uh, audio difficulties at, at this time. <coughs> Larry Seljavold. Here. Chuck Hendrickson. Here. Steve Lindos. Here. And Mayor Jonathan Judd. Here. And Deb White. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member White. Thanks, I'm back. <laughs> Just audio. All, all good, no worries. Well, please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> My apologies to those at home. Uh, city planner uh, 
Christy Lashovsky had took a, a phone call uh, during the uh, pledge. So just so everyone at home knows, it was uh, completely inadvertent that the call came in first. So uh, we'll go ahead and move forward with the meeting. Uh, item number three, agenda amendments. Are there any amendments to tonight's agenda? My understanding is that uh, item number 14 was taken off consent. That's correct, Mr. Mayor. Any other amendments to tonight's agenda other than those that one stated? No, I don't believe so. Thank you, Madam City Manager Volkers. Then is there a motion to approve uh, tonight's agenda other than or with the uh, the addition to item number 14 coming off of consent? So Second, Deb White. First, Steve Lindas. So a motion was made by Council Member Lindas, seconded by Council Member White. Madam Clerk, can we have a roll call vote, please? Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Larry Seljevold. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes, yes. Steve Lindos. Yes. And back to Larry Seljevold. Let the record reflect that Council Member <clears throat> Seljevold is uh, again present on the uh, WebEx uh, screen. Uh, we're not sure if we lost audio. But we, Councilmember Seljevold? Yes. I'll take that as a vote for the motion. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, no worries. I wasn't sure that was a yes to me responding or asking if you were there or, or to the motion. So motion passes. Both. <laughs> we move on to uh, item number four <clears throat> on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Hendrick said so moved. Watson Curry, second. You get that, Madam Clerk? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then will you please uh, initiate a roll call vote, please? Steve Lindos. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Larry Seljevold. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> We move on to item number five on tonight's agenda, which is the approval of the minutes, 5A, the meeting minutes from March 23rd, 2020, and also uh, item 5B, the special council meeting minutes from March 27th, 2020. Any additions, corrections, edits on those minutes? Duran moves approval of both A and B. Seconds. Who was the second? Uh, the second was. Sounds good. Second. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Clerk. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley yes. Carlson. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Larry Seljevold. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Steve Lindos. Yes. Motion carries. Item number six, uh, citizens addressing the council. 
Uh, Madam City Planner, have we had any uh, citizens that might have called in wishing to address the council? Madam City Clerk, have we received any electronic communications for citizens that wish to address to the council at this time? Not at this time. Okay. Thank you both. <clears throat> so it's 5.41 p.m. We have to wait four minutes to uh, start the public hearings portion of our meeting. However, we could jump down to item number 14. Uh, for the Pub Public Works Department, which is a resolution to approve budget adjustment 20-016 uh, to purchase an air burner for wood waste. Uh, Mr. Steve Moore. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, last City Council meeting, I had given a <clears throat> forestry update that included a uh, discussion on the need to purchase a air curtain air burner for our wood waste at the compost site. Um, and that's what I'm requesting uh, to you the budget adjustment for to purchase that. Half of the funding I have requested from Clay County and they have agreed to provide half the funding uh, pending a, a completed memorandum of understanding for the purchase and operation of the air burner which I received the draft from the city attorney's office that I'm reviewing right now. So um, I don't expect any issues uh, in being able to come up with a a memorandum of understanding that's acceptable to both the city and Clay County. So we should have half of the funding for that. I'm um, asking for a total of $120,000. 86,000 is for the other half of the purchase. And then the other portion is to fund uh, the Title V perm air permit that is required to operate the air curtain uh, air burner. So that's why it's a $120,000 request. Um, and with that, I'll answer. We have a couple of options for funding. Uh, the original plan was to use forestry reserves, um, which we have, but uh, using that 120,000 would take us down to about 27% of my operating budget, which is just barely above the recommended uh, requirement to keep 25% of the operating budget in reserves. So the other op option is to take out a local loan uh, at a local bank and we have received a, a uh, potential interested party in that. And then the third option is to borrow it from our internal service fund, the 701 Vehicle and Equipment Fund, which has a current balance of uh, almost 3.5 million. Um, and what we would do is borrow that uh, money from that fund and then pay it back with 2% interest back uh, from the forestry fund reserves over the next five years. So those are the three options. So my request today is to uh, approve the budget adjustment um, using one of those options to purchase an air curtain air burner. With that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, are there any uh, questions from the council? I believe I'm looking at uh, the screen regarding um, the hand wave. And I know Council Member Seljavold, if you, I know you don't have uh, access to do that, but if you uh, wish to comment. I do see two coming up. The first one I saw was Council Member White, and then I'll pass it over to Council Member Carlson after Council Member White. Thanks. Uh, Steve, thanks for the information. I know in your packet you mentioned option three. Um, would uh, save us some money on interest, but I, but I also just wondered if we were depleting that those funds with interest rates as low as they are right now. Um, I just wondered if it would be, if there is a potential detriment of spending down that money instead of. No, um, with the, what we have projected over the next five years in the vehicle and equipment uh, capital improvement program, plus the money we generate annually uh, through our rental program into the internal service fund, uh, I don't have any concerns of borrowing $120,000 of that 3.5 million and repaying it in the five years. Thanks. Councilmember Carlson. Sorry, Councilmember Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Moore, can you um, just talk a little bit about the money that is generated? Would you ever anticipate that over the next five years that there's a potential that you could pay it off in maybe four years? 
Um, that was my first question. The second question is because there's a possibility of interest rates becoming so low, would it be prudent to look at option number one, going to a bank with a, a lower interest rate, and possibly lower than the 2%? Um, I just kind of want your thoughts on, on that, that possibility. Councilmember Carlson, thanks for your questions. Um, the question of paying it off sooner, uh, sure. most likely not as uh, during my briefing last council uh, meeting, I do, we do have to discuss uh, increasing the forestry fees in order to build the reserves greater than they are for the emerald ash borer arrival, um, which is to be determined. So with the current, and we are still currently, our fees are under the 2011 fee rate that uh, we cut significantly in 2012 and again in 2013. And then, uh, so we, we're still below, you know, 10 year, our fees 10 years ago. So I do have concerns about um, rebuilding that cash reserve. Uh, so I don't anticipate us being able to pay it off before five years, given the needs for the operating budget and the fee structure. And your second question was, um, yes, our, our finance director has, um, is awaiting a couple of other responses on, from other local institutions. Uh, and we'll see if, if right now the, the one bank who has given us a, a proposal is above that 2%. And if we'll wait for a couple more, and if any of those come in, of course, lower than 2%, then that would be the smartest course of action. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, I did see what I thought were some hands popping up and then went away. Uh, Councilmember White. Councilmember White. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, just wanted to follow up because I know we talked about the, you know, in terms of Emerald Ash Bore and the importance of properly disposing um, of the wood. Um, <clears throat> so just if you could, re, you know, talk about that a little bit. So it's not a matter of, we, we need to find a way of getting rid of this because if we were to just leave these, leave the wood, wouldn't that increase the chance that, um, you know, that it could, uh, you know, increase the prevalence of, of emerald ash borer in our area for not finding ways of properly disposing of this wood? Yeah, Council Member White, that is correct. Um, there is a requirement um, to when you, when you collect wood that's uh, infected with emerald ash borer that you either chip it or burn it and not store it, and you certainly can't transport it. Uh, s during certain months, but we wouldn't want to do that anyway. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a requirement. So really this need for the air burners twofold. One is the emerald ash borer uh, and our increase in wood waste that we're expected from, from that. But um, we are, I'm running out of room currently uh, with the amount of wood waste I have in my compost site without a viable solution um, to that. So this is the most cost effective solution we, we've uh, come up with. Thank you, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Are there any other uh, questions? Council Member Seljavold, I see your hand. Yep, Steve. What uh, what would the what? How much wood would the county add to this? To the what the tonnage that you're using, or anticipate the city's going to it? And are we collecting fees from the county? Yes, uh, that's a great question, uh, Council Member Seljavold. We are currently um, collecting wood from. Uh, Moorhead, City of Moorhead, as well as Clay County, as well as sometimes even outside uh, Clay, outside of the, the area. Um, and we do charge fees. We have three, three level, three tier fee structure, one for the Moorhead and uh, trees removed in Moorhead. And then we have another rate for Clay County, which is higher. And then the highest rate is for out of state or you know Fargo area. Um, so we do have a fee structure. And uh, additional wood waste is probably your question from Clay County. We may get some from, from flood activity. Last year, for example, um, there was some wood waste in North Moorhead, uh, right across the bridge, uh, and not in Moorhead, but um, in Clay County, and I didn't have any room to take that wood waste. So we would take some of the, 
the flood wood waste for the county and burn that for them, but there would be a fee associated for accepting any wood into the compost site. Thank you. <clears throat> any other uh, questions for Mr. Moore? Okay, then with that, uh, there is a resolution that is attached with this um, item as well. Is there anyone that wishes to make a motion to approve the resolution? Oh, wait, I see a hand up. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Mr. Councilmember Lindos, did you have a hand up? No, I was just gonna make the motion. I thought that's what you were asking. Oh, no, I would say go, go, go ahead and make it. All right, Councilmember Lindos uh, moves um, a funding option number three, and that's a viable financing through a bank um, for the a lower interest rate. Is there a second? I second that. Councilmember Carlson? I second. Okay, thank you. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Madam Clerk. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Larry Seljevold. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Steve Lindos. Yes. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Motion carries. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, then we'll go back up to item number eight, <clears throat> which is a public hearing regarding the request of Kathy uh, Mayer or Meyer on behalf of Enclave Solutions LLC for property tax exemption for a project located at 1547 30th. Avenue South. Is there a motion to take us into public hearing? No moves. Hendrickson, so moved. Deb White, second. Motion made by Councilmember Hendrickson, seconded by Councilmember White. All in favor of moving into public hearing, I will defer to Madam City Clerk. Shelley Dahlquist? Yes. Sarah Watson Curry? Yes. Shelly Carlson? Yes. Heidi Durand? Yes. Deb White? Yes. Larry Seljevold? Yes. Chuck Hendrickson? Yes. Steve Lindos? Yes. Motion carries. We are now in public hearing, and I'll pass it over to, I believe, uh, Mr. LaPointe. Are you the point person on this tonight? I am, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Pretty good, sir. How about you and your family? We're doing well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for uh, obviously doing the things virtually here. It's uh, a new way of life, but uh, we still have projects and we still want to move things forward. So we do have uh, a Mr. Tim Gleason, I believe, on the line. Uh, he's on hold with uh, with uh, Christy right now. Hopefully, if you have any specific questions to the project itself. Um, but this project is. Um, is from Enclave Solutions LLC. They have plans to construct a almost 25,000 square foot um, two-story commercial office building. This would be leased by one tenant. Uh, at this point in time, uh, it's Solutions Behavioral Network. It's uh, it's a
we'd be seeking your approval tonight of a five-year exemption on this uh, office building. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I know Mr. Gleason is on the line uh, if you have any specific questions regarding the project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaPointe. Um, any council members have any questions? I don't see any hands on the screen coming up. So thank you, Mr. LaPointe. Uh, is there any way, um, Madam City Planner, if we can bring in Mr. Gleason? Okay. Uh, Mr. Gleason, uh, if you wish to add any comments uh, to what uh, Mr. LaPointe stated regarding the project, you're more than uh, welcome to do so. Uh, no, not at this time. I think unless you guys have any specific questions, um, then uh, I think we're, we're good to go. Okay. Thank you for uh, being virtual with us tonight. Yeah, thanks for uh, opening it up. It's uh, definitely a different way of doing things, but, but very nice to be able to meet this this way. So. Absolutely. No problem. Okay. Uh, seeing that we don't have any questions, uh, is there a motion to take us out of public hearing? Council Member Lindas moves to move out of public hearing. Deboit yeah, seconds. Henderson second. <clears throat> we'll give it to Council Member White. Okay. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Larry Seltravold. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Steve Lindos. Yes. Okay, motion carries. We are out of public hearing. <clears throat> and we'll proceed to item 9A. Is our motion to approve the resolution as stated? Deb White, so moved. Lindos, second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, Madam City Clerk. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelly Carlson. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Larry Seljavold. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Steve Lindos. Yes. Shelly Dahlquist. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, then we'll move on to uh, item number nine, which is a public hearing regarding the request of Deanne Kading Powell on behalf of Rich ND Properties LLC for property tax exemption for a project located at 1601 Main Avenue Southeast. Is there a motion to take us back into public hearing? Linda, move to bring the public hearing. Shelly Carlson, second. Motion has been made and seconded. And I will pass it again back to Madam City Clerk. Steve Lindos. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Larry Seljavold. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Motion carries. We're back in public hearing. And then uh, Mr. LaPointe, I think you're you're back up again. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, again, projects uh, continue to come. This is a, a uh, project, as, uh, as you mentioned, from Deanne Dating Powell. She is uh, hopefully on the line as well, if you have any specific questions for, for this project. Uh, they have plans to construct an approximately 8,000 square foot commercial building that will be leased to WAG Stay and Play, which is the pet daycare boarding and training facility and Wags and Whiskers, which is the pet grooming facility owned by um, Ms. Powell. The facility 
Uh, obviously, he has an office, reception area, indoor and outdoor exercise uh, uh, areas, uh, and, uh, and obviously room for their, their training facilities. This uh, building will have about 22 full-time employees and it will create two new full-time employees. Uh, again, like most uh, of our, uh, like all of our commercial industrial property tax incentives, the land is still taxable, which is approximately $115,000 of the land value. The new project, the new taxable value as uh, estimated by the city assessor is about $575,000. Uh, this project again is looking to um, construct this summer and uh, is zoned within the right of the uh, community commercial zoning district. At this point in time, it does meet all of our considerations and requirements of the commercial industrial property tax incentive program. And we would be seeking approval of, of this project. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or as I mentioned, I believe Deanne is on the call for any business specific questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaPointe. And I see that Council Member White uh, has her hand up. Council Member White. Thanks, Derek. Uh, if you could just forgive my ignorance, but tell me what is a Morton style building and if you could talk a little bit about how it fits with the gateway overlay standard. Yeah, so a Morton style building is um, it's kind of your traditional industrial type building. Um, they're wood framed. Um, usually it's basically what you would see along that overlay of the interstate right now. Um, and obviously through our gateway overlay that we have along the interstate, there is additional standard for visibility of the interstate, uh, additional building requirement, uh, materials, et cetera. And they do meet that based on uh, what they've submitted and what they'll be working on for their permit through the planning and inspection department. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I, I didn't see a design. There wasn't a mock-up of it. So that's why I just was trying to picture. I assumed it was something like that. Great. And uh, just so everyone is aware to uh, Ms. Kading Powell, um, who is a, represent a representative uh, for the project in this hearing is also on the line and available for uh, questions as well. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. LaPointe and Ms. Kading Powell, are you present? Yep, I'm here. Great, thank you. Thank you for uh, appearing uh, tonight virtually. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate your time. And do you have any uh, comments uh, you wish to add on behalf of the project? No, we're just really excited about it and we just appreciate everyone listening to us. Hey, thank you. Uh, Council, does, does anyone have any uh, questions or uh, comments for uh, Mr. LaPointe or Ms. Kading Powell? Okay, uh, hearing none, then um, is there a motion to take us out of public hearing? And uh, so moved. Watson Curry. Carlson, second. Madam Clerk, uh, I'll have you uh, decide who got the second on that one. I'm gonna give it to Sarah Watson Curry. So Sarah Watson Curry? Yes. Shelly Carlson? Yes. Heidi Durand? Yes. Deb White? Yes. Larry Seldrevold? Yes. Chuck Hendrickson? Yes. Steve Lindos? Yes. And Shelley Dahlquist? Yes. Motion carries. We are out of public hearing. <clears throat> and then is there a motion to approve the resolution? Duran moves approval. Second, Chuck. Motion's been made and uh, seconded by uh, council, or sorry, Madam City Clerk. <laughs> Shelly Dahlquist? Yes. Sarah Watson Curry? Yes. Shelly Carlson? Yes. Heidi Durand? Yes. Deb White? Yes. Larry Selgefold? Yes. Chuck Hendrickson? Yes. Steve Lindos? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. They will move to uh, item number 10, <clears throat> which is a public hearing for 12 
Avenue South, engineering number 20-A2-01A and 6th and 7th Avenue North and 18th and 20th Street North, engineering number 20-A2-01, sorry, 01B Street Improvements. Is there a motion to take us back into public hearing? Duran, so moved. Second, White. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, Madam City Clerk. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelly Carlson. Yes. Shelly Dahlquist. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Larry Seljavold. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. And Steve Lindos. Yes. Motion carries, and I will turn it over to Assistant City Engineer, Mr. Trowbridge. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the, uh, this public hearing is for uh, two street projects that started out separate, but we have merged them for financing purposes. Um, tw uh, 20-A2-01A is 12th Avenue South from 4th Street to Southeast Main Avenue and 6th and 7th Avenue North and 18th and 20th Street North, which is uh, numbered 20-A2-01B. Um, and both of these are in the city's five-year capital improvement plan. And I have a presentation here. Okay. Uh, one B, yep, do that one. So I'll start with the project area for the A project, which is 12th Avenue South from 4th Street to Southeast Main Avenue. This project is a little more complicated than typical because it involves part of our detour route for the Southeast Main Underpass project. So we've actually structured this to be a two-year contract uh, because we can't work on that segment from 20th Street to Southeast Main because it's, it's the necessary detour route for the underpass project. Mm -hmm. And that will take all of this construction season. Uh, we're fairly confident that we'll be able to uh, uh, be working at this early next year. So for the 2020 construction, it would be a mill and overlay from 4th Street to 20th Street. And then in 2021, we would reconstruct it from 20th to Southeast Main Avenue. We would also construct improvements to the railroad crossing, which we're still working with BNSF on that part of it. That would be let as a separate contract um, in 2021. And the intent is to make that a more comfortable crossing to cross. It's pretty rough with the five tracks there. And also to make the necessary safety improvements that would allow us to apply for a quiet zone for the railroad tracks that parallel 20th Street. Uh, that is something that periodically, every year we'll get a few calls asking, why do the trains blow their whistles? And that uh, this track is the one that it has eight or 10 trains a day, very close to existing homes, has multiple rail crossings. So it's a very noticeable one. Uh, there. So the History of 12th Avenue South, just to give a little background, uh, from 4th to 20th Street, it was built basically about 1955. Uh, by our records, it's called Road Mix, which is it's either a very thin layer of asphalt or uh, was oil and sand or something, but I think, I think what it was about a two inch layer of asphalt put on top of it. That, wasn't suitable to last for very long, but they got almost 30 to 40 years out of it, and then they rehabbed it in the late 80s, early 90s. And at that time, what we typically did for this type of a roadway was called full depth asphalt. So it has about 12 inches of asphalt on top of a soil cement base. So they, they mixed in some lime into the subgrade, just right into the clay. And that kind of turns it into a clay concrete 
it is fairly durable, but it's still not the, it's not as good as having a gravel base. And so when we would do a road like that nowadays, we would use gravel base instead of the soil cement. However, it's, it's held up pretty well, and you can see by the PCI, the pavement condition index, that it's in the 68 to 74 range, which is suitable for a mill and overlay. And with as much pavement as is there, we know we can do that. So that's what's proposed for that segment. Uh, the piece from 20th Street to Southeast Main was built in the 1960s. Uh, that was also bituminous on soil cement base. It had less bituminous though, and what's currently there is about four inches plus probably numerous seal coats and patches by Public Works over the years. Um, and it's, in our opinion, that is, is, it's surpassed its useful life. It's in an industrial park, and so our proposal for a road like that, minor arterial, industrial park, truck traffic, we would want that to be a concrete pavement. Other existing conditions out there, it has sidewalk uh, in most areas, except there's nothing from 20th Street to Southeast Main. That's a very visible part of the city. Because there's so few rail crossings, we do get frequent requests to try to get some better ped connectivity through there, and, and that is part of this proposal. Otherwise, there's sidewalks everywhere. We'd like to improve where we have room Without taking out trees, we'd like to improve to have at least one side have an eight to 10 foot wide sidewalk so it's suitable for bicycles as well. Um, and then utilities are generally in good condition out there uh, other than you know, manhole castings and there's a few manholes we'd replace. Uh, Moorhead Public Service has a short stretch of water main that they would replace in advance of this project. And then uh, this being as it's a minor arterial roadway, it was eligible to get some federal planning dollars and we worked with MetroCog and we actually were able to do a corridor study in advance of the project. So we got a lot of useful public input in the process. We had two general public input meetings. We had a study review committee that included uh, uh, a member from Concordia and, uh, on it and that met various times and helped to formulate what the design of this project should be. We also had two online surveys. And then in advance of this hearing, we did mail out uh, notices to everybody in the assessment area. And we've been receiving some comments since then. The initial online survey during the corridor study had 172 responses. That was focusing on what were the issues and needs of the corridor, pavement condition ranked high, Bicycle and pedestrian connectivity was important. Trying to get some railroad crossing improvements for that crossing at 20th was also important. And the trees and streetscaping and transit were also identified through that. Um, the second survey had 26 responses and this one came after we had formulated a lot of alternatives for people to consider. And generally, out of those responses, there was a lot of support for the pedestrian improvements we were trying to make. And one of the comments was, if it was a choice between trying to make a wider sidewalk or preserving the mature trees, and this is specifically in that area from 11th to 19th Street, the general consensus was keep the trees and then put the bikes onto the road. And the traffic volumes are low enough that we can do that with the pavement width we have. And so that is what's proposed in this area is to have a signed shared roadway from 11th to 19th Street. And we had looked at, uh, the general public comment had said just do bike lanes, but before doing that, we know, to, we know that that's an area that there's on-street parking currently. And so we reached out to the property owners and they definitely, they gave us a pretty clear preference that they wanted to keep the on-street parking if possible. And so we're proposing a signed shared roadway, which is there's pavement markings on the road and signs basically advising drivers to uh, be respectful of the bikes and the bikes to be respectful of, of the drivers. 
And so I, I, as I've been saying, uh, it's a Millen overlay from 4th to 20th Street. We're doing a little bit of extra work just at 11th Street and to the west of it to line it up. If you're familiar driving it, there's a bit of an offset because of the way the parking is on the one side there. And so we're going to redo the roadway to make that uh, more functional. And it also helps us keep a little further away from the crazy tree that Concordia has there. So we, we can avoid damaging it. So, And then from 20th Street to Southeast Main, we would be fully reconstructing it and trying to improve the crossing so that we can apply for a quiet zone after the project is complete. Uh, there's a lot of pedestrian improvements. Just about every intersection, we have to redo ped ramps to become compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act standards. And we're adding a fair amount of 8 to 10 foot wide uh, sidewalks along the corridor. And then MPS will replace uh, 270 feet of their 12 inch water main in the area of 18th to 18 and a half Street. So the 6th and 7th Avenue North and 18th and 20th Street North project area is an area that was added to the CIP this year. It had not previously been in the CIP because we knew that they were roads that we couldn't mill and overlay them. There wasn't enough pavement to do that with. We were hoping they'd last longer, but effectively they're in that last years of their life where as long as we can easily maintain them by filling a few potholes or, or something like that, we'll do it. But if it, beget, if it becomes very substantial work that needs to be done, then it's time to reconstruct it. And that happened in 2019. Public Works Department had to do very extensive repairs out there. And these are roads, they were built in the 1950s. They are what we would call the gravel and oil or oil and sand roads. So basically they took the existing gravel, threw some oil on it, stirred it up and compacted it. And ever since then, there've been a bunch of seal coats. And given that that's how the roads are built, they've, they've lasted a long time <laughs> and so, I would say that uh, we've done a very good job maintaining them up to this point. Uh, there's also some drainage is issues out there that's typical in Moorhead. We've got very little elevation to play with and so the curb grades are always pretty flat and after 50 or 60 years, it's not unusual to have some issues with that. So in this case, there are sidewalks out there on at least one side of the road most of the places and we did send out a letter to solicit some input on whether or not we should consider adding some sidewalks and it was uh, pretty overwhelming that they did not want additional sidewalks added out there. Uh, the utilities are the sewers are in good condition. If there's any sanitary sewer repairs typically what we would do with the older clay tile pipe is we would line it, which can be done without digging up the street. So they've got a liner you can insert down the pipe and you effectively blow it up and it cures in place. And so it, when we do a road project, we don't have to replace the sewer uh, for that. Uh, the water mains are different because of uh, the way the services have to be, you have to dig those up to reconnect them. So there's usually a lot more water main work uh, that requires street patching. And so in this case, we've worked with Moorhead Public Service and they will replace the cast iron water mains in advance of our construction contract. So in this case, we're going to propose complete removal and replacement of the pavement and the curb and gutter. The curb is tipping quite a bit, so even though maybe it doesn't look as bad a condition, it doesn't meet standards for ADA and it shows that it, it just it doesn't have the support so we need to remove the curb get the gravel where it needs to be and then pour a brand new curb and gutter the benefit of doing that is it also helps us address when this project is done it will have much better drainage than it has had for a while and then in doing this we'll replace the storm sewer leads to make them line up with the curb and gutter that we're putting in uh, but otherwise, there aren't really, it's just very minimal utility improvements that are proposed other than the Moorhead Public Service water main. So we had a design informational meeting uh, on February 27th for this North Moorhead project. Generally, it was questions about what happens during construction, how do I have access to my home, uh, 
things like that. And uh, there's always discussion about how special assessments will work. Um, and then we solicited some additional feedback specifically on sidewalks and uh, most of the property owners did not want new sidewalks, so that was deleted from the project prior to going to bid. And then we sent out a mailed notice on April 2nd. And as of April 8th, I think we had six phone calls with eight pretty generic questions about it. And there were, uh, in this case, the assessment area has 49 properties, so we sent out 49 letters for this one. For the 12th Avenue project, there were over a thousand letters that got sent out, and on that one, we've received nine phone calls with questions and six emails. And out of the six emails, three were just general questions, weren't opposing the project, and the other three were opposing it, mostly due to timing. One of them was concerned about possible con conflicting with the underpass project and then the others were more just delay the project because of the number of assessments that, that they've got and they're concerned about cost with the economics and the COVID-19. So for these projects, uh, the 12th Avenue project, as I said, has mill and overlay uh, from 4th to 20th Street. So, that, so those properties that directly front on 12th and have access to it have a $30 per front foot assessment. And then all properties that are within the assessment area, uh, which extends both north and south for several blocks, gets a $500 assessment in addition to any uh, front footage that they might have had. And then from, uh, uh, from 20th Street to Southeast Main, the properties get that $500 per equivalent lot assessment plus $105 per foot if they directly front and have access to. And I think that was only one property that had direct access to 12th Avenue and got the $105 per front foot assessment. And then the properties in North Moorhead, those were all reconstructs, so they would all get the $105 per front foot assessment. There's no area-wide assessment for them because they don't have a collector or arterial roadway assessment. And most of those lots are 50-foot lots in North Moorhead, so there, most of those assessments were $5,250. Right. Okay. okay, so this map shows the uh, assessment area for 12th Avenue South and so this would be the 15th slide in the presentation and so it identifies where it's road reconstruction versus mill and overlay and then you can see a dashed boundary that shows we're generally assessing from 6th Avenue South down to 16th Avenue South parallel to the length of the improvements. And so for 12th Avenue South, as I said, there is over 1,000 mailings. There's 1,018 properties that were in that total assessment area and get the $500 assessment. Out of those 1,018 properties, 54 of them also get a front footage assessment. The largest single assessment was $113,000. That would have been one of Concordia's. Uh, on average, the assessment was $1,275. Obviously, with the area-wide, there's a lot of $500 assessments in there. For those that have direct front footage, the average assessment was $3,700. For the North Moorhead portion of the project, uh, one thing you might notice on this is there's a lot of side lot footage. Most of the properties in North Moorhead face the streets and very few face the avenues. This project is actually a little top heavy on avenues and by our assessment policy we do 150 foot side lot credit. In this case all of those properties that front on 7th Avenue and 6th Avenue unless their address was on that road they wouldn't even be paying an assessment on it and they would only be assessed 
their short side. So even if they had 150 feet on 7th, they're only paying 50 feet of it. And then when we do the, the street in front of their house on the, if that, was, if that was the case, then they don't get assessed for that one. So generally we don't have a lot of properties getting assessed for this project, which is one of the reasons it's hard to generate the 20% that we need in order to bond for it, and that's why we're combining this with 12th Avenue. So with 6th and 7th Avenue and 18th and 20th Street North, there are 48 properties that are getting assessments. The average assessment is $5,970. Most of them had a $5,250 assessment because almost all of the lots are 50 feet wide. There were I think there's two of them that happen to be double lots, and so they had 100 feet of frontage, and that's why the maximum assessments were $10,500. So the total project financing, when you combine the two projects together, is $6.8 million. Out of that, we have one point, almost $1.8 million in federal funding that can be spent on 12th Avenue South and that's because it's a collector arterial roadway and we've budgeted about five hundred thousand dollars in municipal state aid dollars that will go towards the project specifically when we do the rail project the rail crossing part of it next year that msa funds will make up the difference there uh, special assessments there will be a total of about 1.6 million dollars in special assessments on this project 1.3 million is from the 12th Avenue assessment area and 300,000 is from the North Moorhead area. And then the total amount we're bonding is $4,543,000. So we're assessing 1.6 million, which is 36% of the bond, which meets that requirement. We have to be more than 20% to bond. And then the remaining $2.9 million of that gets paid back by the city through the, uh, from the general tax levy. So the project schedule for this project is we've received bids for both of them. Um, we're holding the public hearing tonight and because we had a glitch in the mailed notice, we had a couple of typos in there, so we sent out a follow-up mailing and our recommendation is to hold the hearing open until April 27th that's the most conservative approach anyway. It gives people an extra two weeks to comment. Um, and then at the close of the hearing on April 27th, we would ask that the council consider ordering the improvements. And if the council does order the improvements, then we would ask that uh, the council awards the bids for the two projects. And then the assessment hearing could be done in 2020, that's typically what we would do is we would hold the hearing in the fall of the same year that we are constructing the improvements. However, 12th Avenue stretches into another year, so we could certainly hold off. And even for the North Moorhead, you know, we, it, it's at the council's discretion whether to do it this year or next year. The main thing would be financing wise, prior to issuing the bonds, we would have to have planned for how that goes because that's, that's how the bonds are structured as well. I mean, they, they need to know how we're intending to pay back the improvements. So, so that all factors into it. So, so if there are any questions. Yes, uh, Council Member Watson Curry had her hand up and then Council Member Carlson uh, will follow up. So Council Member Watson Curry, I'll turn it over to you. Can you hear me now? Yep, uh, probably want to speak okay. up just a little bit more. Okay, uh, so thank you, Tom, for the information. And I just wanted to say, uh, express my appreciation for the robust communication to residents for both the North um, Moorhead project as well as the 12th Avenue. Um, and uh, there was a really robust outreach with the surveys for the um, 12th Avenue um, reconstruction, and I love the mention of the, the crazy tree. That was the first panic response I heard as <laughs> people thought we were taking down the crazy tree. So thanks for mentioning that. I did just have one question. Um, if any sort of conversation or um, data points were 
um, taken in about the one ways that um, start on 12th. Um, I believe 14th does. I think, I can't remember if 11th does or if that's further north, but I'm just curious if that was studied or discussed at all and what sort of um, congestion or safety issues that it might bring up. So that's all I have. Okay. So for the for this corridor study, I don't believe that there was any discussion of the one-way pair system. I do know that subject has come up and been studied under other at other times and like for example with the uh, 11th Street underpass, it's been looked at as part of that. And if there's ever a change to be made, that would be more likely the vehicle that it would happen under. But yeah, the, this corridor study did not get into that. Uh, then I'll pass over to Council Member Carlson and then Council Member Dahlquist. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Trowbridge, um, first of all, thank you for allowing extra time for the public to provide comment. I know with um, the virtual meetings and having to call in an email, um, the process is a little bit unique and different and, and I appreciate you giving time, additional time to the citizens. Um, I know that one of the questions that came up was um, about possibly delaying these projects and I'm wondering if you could just speak to how does that um, affect the five-year plan that's been developed since this has been in the works since 2015, I believe. Um, how does that affect the bidding process and having to synchronize all of the work being done with the city, all the work being done with MPS? Um, I'm just trying to understand what are the residual effects of if this doesn't get approved, if you could kind of speak to that. <laughs> yes, uh, we've we've been coordinating closely with Moorhead Public Service on water main repair and replacement issues, and I think they have bid. They've definitely bid some projects already, and there's other projects that they've planned their crews to do, and so making a change at this point would would really mess up their schedule. Um, and then as far as 12th Avenue South, that's a project that when, you, when we get federal funding, there's a, there is a discrete timeline on that. And because the, the federal government, if they provide funding, they don't like it if you don't spend it. So what ends up happening is if you don't spend it, it gets sent to someone who can spend it. So if we backed out on 12th Avenue now, the, the MnDOT would have to find another project to put it on, and that would, that would be difficult to do, but we wouldn't, it, we wouldn't have a project that we could put it on. So it would go to another city, and we'd have to reapply. I don't know when we'd get the funding. So it, it, there's a significant risk if we don't proceed with 12th Avenue for that. And then with the North Moorhead project, that's one that we've done quite a bit of coordination with Morehead Public Service. And on top of that, it's creating, if we don't do that project, it will affect the public works budget because they will have more and more ongoing repairs as they try to keep that road uh, passable for the public. Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. Um, and then Mr. Trowbridge, can you just respond um, as to if the federal funds are are not accessed or utilized for this project, how frequently do those opportunities come around? And then do we get dinged later on if we were awarded these funds and then turn those funds back in? <laughs> I, I don't know if we'd get dinged because we haven't done, it, it definitely doesn't look good for us. Um, if, I, I think the main thing about this funding is MnDOT does like to plan well in advance. So this type of funding is, it's, it's already set for the next five years. So basically if we passed on this funding now and we wanted to use federal funding for 12th Avenue South, 
it's probably five years before we would have a shot at it again. And, um, and, and, and it's, it might take longer. Typically, we're able to get some funding for a federal, federal aid project every two or three years. Um, the, other, uh, the other risk you run is you never, you're never sure of how much funding that will be over time. Now, it's, it's possible that the federal government in MnDOT may make changes on how the program is administered too. So we just never know. Okay, and then you had said that the, um, there were uh, letters or contacts made with 1,019 properties that were affected and there were really just three opposing emails that were sent to you, is that correct? Correct. All right. Okay, those are all the questions I had. Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. Yep. <clears throat> then I'll uh, pass it over to Councilmember Dahlquist who had her hand up next. And then I believe Councilmember Lindos. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. I really appreciate uh, the presentation, and I uh, also appreciate the extension and time. And then I just had one question about um, there, the possibility of different uh, interest rates. Um, and I also appreciate that we can um, make the assessments later. That extension is great, and I think the people that are being assessed appreciate that also. So if you could just tell me about the um, variability of the interest rates. Okay, so I think your question is regarding the notice that went out, we put in an estimate of what the assessments would be and also included a, a theoretical interest rate for what the assessment would be. And at this point, we don't know what that number is. We put in a number that is a little bit on the high side just to try to be safe, because uh, that's the last thing we want to do is tell somebody something and then we get to the end of the project and we give them a higher number. So we, we're trying to be conservative at this point. The interest rate that is used on the special assessment gets adopted at the time the assessment roll is adopted and it is based on the rate of the GO bond plus typically about one and a half percent and the extra that the city puts on it has to do with when we structure the bond we have to pay back the bond over a specific time frame we've also issued the funds or we've 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 been using the funds and incurring interest for a period of time before we assess the project as well those two factors uh, require us to have a higher interest than what we pay because, for example, a lot of these $500 assessments will get paid off early. People might just simply pay them off in one year or two years and we're still paying it off over time with interest and so that additional interest rate, the higher rate that we charge is a financing tool that, that makes that work for us. It's, it's part of the planning but the actual amount is based on the GO bond and that has been anywhere from two and a half to four percent over the past 10 years or so. Given the current economic situation, it's likely to be lower than that, but I, I really don't know until we, we bid out the general obligation bond. Any follow-up, Councilmember Dahlquist? No, nope, thank you very much. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, I see a Councilmember uh, Seljafo. We'll do Councilmember Lindos first, and then we'll go to you. Thank you, Mayor Judd, um, and thank you, Tom, um, for the presentation. I guess um, uh, just echoing um, Councilmember Dahlquist's uh, point of the extension of the ex assessments that can actually help um, people in the region um, that might be experiencing financial difficulties. Um, but I guess the other thing to point out, and I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward to these projects, um, mainly because it's a system, and if we don't, uh, well, if, we, if the city stops business, um, 
that also affects economics for the, for the companies and um, people that are actually working. You know, the, if, if there are people, um, if there are businesses that are affected, I'm sure the city can help. Um, I don't think um, Mr. LaPointe is on the call anymore, but I know that there's, there's resources out there. And so if people are feeling um, financial problems, the city can certainly help try to address those. Uh, yeah, that's a really good, good point uh, brought up by uh, Council Member uh, Dahlquist and uh, Lindas. Uh, Mr. Trubich, can you speak briefly before I pass it over to Council Member Seljavold? He may uh, have a question about, about this too, but about the importance of these projects moving forward, uh, because there will be a lot of people who are probably watching or listening right now that will have some concerns about us conducting business, quote unquote, as usual while we're going through the pandemic. Can you briefly kind of touch base about the importance of these projects moving forward in okay. light of this? Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, as an engineer, I try to stick to just the, the engineering facts of it. And, and these are roads that, uh, from our perspective, there's a window that if we don't do the mill and overlay, it may not be possible later. So we, we really don't like deferring projects for that reason. Obviously, there's an economic argument about um, it's, it's the balance between people having to pay special assessments. It's one more cost for them. But when the city proceeds with work, the government's doing infrastructure projects a lot of times are considered something of a stimulus, you know, and they're important for the economy that way. And so that, that's a trade-off. You know, as, as an from an engineering perspective, I, I try not to comment on that, but, but that's... That's definitely something that that we we expect to see discussed. So. No, thank you. And I was asking for that perspective. I wouldn't put you on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> burner for the pol the policy aspect. So, uh, Councilmember Lindos, I'm sorry, uh, Seljavold. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Tolbridge. I'm looking at the uh, sidewalk improvement map on the north side. And uh, then reading all the reading all the material that went with uh, the guidelines, if you didn't have sidewalks in existing areas and so on. I, one is I'm a little bit surprised because there was not going to be any cost uh, that these people turned it down. And then when you say letters were sent out, are these people whose property will have sidewalks on them, or is, was it the whole project area? We received the questionnaire. <laughs> so when we send that letter out, we send it out specifically to the blocks that we're proposing to put the sidewalk on. So we, if there's blocks that already have all the sidewalks, we don't we don't include them. And to be as friendly as possible, we also will will review the comments on a block by block basis. So if one block supports it, but a couple of others don't, the block that supports it can get the sidewalk. And likewise, we don't make other blocks get it if they've clearly indicated that they don't want it. Typically, there's two reasons that people don't want the sidewalk put in. One obvious snow removal. Uh, people don't like to have to shovel the snow. And uh, the other reason is, in a lot of these, it's, it's common on these corner lots, is that a lot of times their garage faces the corner lot and setbacks are different for a side lot, they're shorter. So what ends up happening is if we put in a sidewalk, it's hard to find a spot where you can put it where they could still park in their driveway. So lost off-street parking tends to be a concern as well. So, so uh, in, the, in the material I got, it said that if, if the developers said there was going to be sidewalks in there and they never got around to doing it, there should be a sidewalk there. Is that the possibility in this neighborhood that uh, the builders and their plans just never got around to putting in a sidewalk? So that part of the policy addresses uh, uh, pro or, uh, areas that have developers' agreements. That's something the city has actually only had since about 1990. Uh, so that's the modern subdivisions have developers' agreements that spell out exactly where sidewalks go. The older part of town, um, more often than not, 
the areas built before 1950 have sidewalks. The areas between 1950 and 1980 are really a hodgepodge. Some of them have some, some of them have none, some of them have one side. And, and that's where when we do these projects, we, we try to uh, make things better that way, get more connectivity to it uh, within the context of the neighborhood. So this is a neighborhood that there never was a developer's agreement with a specific plan saying there will be sidewalks in these areas. So. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember uh, Carlson, I'm not sure if that's a new hand or the hand from the last time. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I forgot to take my hand down. No, no, that's okay. I just didn't wanna make sure that I uh, didn't confuse it. Uh, Dr. Z wishes to uh, approach, this is uh, city engineer, Dr. Bob Zimmerman. I just wanted to, thanks Mayor, I just wanted to back up to the previous question about whether we should be doing these projects or not. The, what we've heard from contractors is they want work. I think the bids that we've received show that they want work. Uh, as, as we discussed last time, there's a lot of steps the city council needs to go through to, to move these projects to construction. And if we don't do it now, we can't pick it up in July or August and have a project. If we don't have projects, contractors don't have work and their employees don't have work. So there's good economic reason to proceed. And thank you for adding that. Uh, and again, my question obviously was not to put <clears throat> uh, the engineers in that, uh, in that situation where they're having to respond to something that's a policy, but I think it's important for the folks at home to understand that, that obviously there is a balance. Um, I will say having uh, jogged and biked along 12th Avenue South, especially in that area where the industrial park is between Southeast Main and uh, 20th Street, it is a complete, I mean, it's just not safe. Um, and I did that uh, two weeks ago, and I got close enough to see that somebody was texting <laughs> while they were coming at me and my, and my friend. So anything I think uh, that can be uh, done to mitigate that and also increase that connectivity between our neighborhoods, I think is a good investment for the uh, city. I think uh, a conversation to be had is when those, when those assessments will, will take place, which I think is fair. In light, of the, in light of the circumstances. But again, I think if the money is there to do these projects and we have obviously some guidelines to work around, they should be at least talked about. So thank you for your information on that. Does that raise any other uh, questions for Mr. Trowbridge or Dr. Zimmerman? Okay, and so uh, just to uh, bring this point back up, so it is your recommendation uh, that we hold this meeting open until the 27th. Correct. So we will not be taking any action this evening. Correct. Okay. And then I'll look up Madden City Planner. Have there been any calls from any uh, residents, citizens regarding this public meeting? Madam City Clerk, have we received any electronic communications from any uh, citizens uh, during this public meeting? Not at this time. Any other questions or comments? Council? Seeing, hearing none, then I'll ask for a motion to take us out of public uh, hearing. So moved, okay. Councilman Berlindos. Councilman Berlindos. Second, Dockwist. Do we want them to? We're holding it open. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. We're holding it open. My my apologies, creature of habit. So okay, so we yeah. will not. We will. I withdraw my motion. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. Okay. And then uh, we'll then then uh, parliamentarian. So if this is now open. Then then I will introduce the other public hearing. Okay. So now uh, we'll move on to item number. 11, which is a public hearing for the 14th Street South, engineering number 20-A2-03 and 18th and 18th and a half Street South, engineering number 20-A2-04, Street Improvements. Is there a motion to go into open, I'm sorry, to a public hearing? 
Deb White, so moved. Second, Chuck. Motion been made and seconded. Uh, Madam City Clerk. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Larry Seljevold. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Steve Lindos. Yes. Motion carries and we are in public hearing regarding item number 11. Mr. Trowbridge. Okay. All right. So these are two projects that were bundled together for one contract. Uh, they're uh, 14th Street and then 18th and 18th and a half street. Uh, all of them are from 9th to 12th Avenue South. Uh, we bundled them together due to their uh, close proximity, similar type of work, so it'll be easier to manage uh, for us. Uh, 14th Street was initially looked at separately just because it's one of our collector streets. And, uh, but uh, again, it's still mill and overlay type work, so good, good project to combine with the other one. So the project area is shown on slide two. And as I said, it's uh, mill and overlay work is what's proposed. The boundaries are from 9th Avenue South to 12th Avenue South. Um, one thing you might notice is that each of these streets is within the area of the area-wide assessment for 12th Avenue South, which is one of the reasons we wanted to hold the hearing tonight because that way everybody got notices and they don't have to try to call two separate meetings. They can come to just the one or, or comment on the one. So uh, I don't know if the clicker's not working. Oh, there it moved. Okay. All right. So in this area, the streets were constructed generally between 1955 and 1962. It's bituminous pavement on either aggregate or soil cement base. The PCIs are still in pretty good condition, 60 to 75, which makes them candidates for mill and overlay. Uh, we have no record of a major maintenance project on 14th Street since it was initially constructed. Doesn't mean nothing happened. It's possible Public Works did some skin patches, uh, some thin lift overlays, and we just didn't record it. And then for 18th and 18 and a half street, uh, 28 years ago, the pavement was milled off completely and then replaced with four inches of new bituminous pavement. And then in, in this area, the last seal coats were 1998 and 2013. Isn't that working again? Okay. Okay, and then the sidewalks are on both sides of the street, except on the east side of the Grace United Methodist Church, which fronts on 18th Street. They do have a sidewalk uh, all the way on 17th Street, though. And then the utilities that are out there, the sanitary sewer, it's the clay tile pipe, but it's in good enough condition now. There's nothing that it needs it to be dug up to fix. At some future date, we expect the, if, if any work needs to be done, the wastewater department can line it, and, and that doesn't affect the pavement. The water main on 14th Street is PVC, replaced over two different projects in 1991, and then more recently in 2014, the last part of it. The water mains on 18th and 18 and a half Street are both six inch cast iron water main and Moorhead Public Service has indicated that they want to replace those. Uh, some of the structures out there for the catch basins, which is what the water goes into in the storm sewer, are brick and are in poor condition, so we will replace those with precast structures. The roadway improvements, we're proposing a two inch mill and overlay with patching at intersections. Uh, that's largely necessary to uh, make things ADA compatible because there's the the road is actually steeper the normal crown of the road is steeper than what the ADA would want and so we'll we'll make those improvements we'll do we'll replace ped ramps 
to be cut to compliant with ADA. Otherwise, no sidewalk work is proposed other than we'd fix trippers and things like that. Uh, utilities out there the, the, will replace some of the storm sewer catch basins and leads. And then the sewer castings will be replaced. And then Mord Public Service is going to replace the water mains on 18th and 18 and a half street. We had a preliminary design information meeting with the, with the residents out there on February 27th. Generally, it was just concerns about how construction would impact them um, and then what the assessments would be like. We did meet separately, specifically with Grace United, to talk about the sidewalk. And they said that they did not want the sidewalk to be extended down 18th Street. And then we mailed out a public hearing notice on April 2nd. Uh, between the two project areas combined, that was 137 mailed notices that were sent out. And out of that, we've received, we actually didn't receive any phone calls, and we've just had the one email. And that person is opposing the project. Mainly, they really were complaining about the time, the timing of it, and their concern about the e economics of doing an assessed project at this time. So for this project, 14th Street is a collector street, so by the policy it gets assessed to a, a wider area. And as a result, that even though there's only 13 properties that get front footage, there's another 84 properties that get the area-wide assessment. And that's a $500 assessment. The front footage assessment is $30 per front foot. And, and then all of the properties on 18th and 18 and a half street, they get just the $30 front footage assessment. So this next slide here, this would be slide, uh, uh, number it, so if you're following from home, this would be slide eight, shows the assessment area for 14th street and it includes all properties from the center of 13th Street to the center of 17th Street. And the reason for those boundaries is west of 13th would be in the 11th Street assessment area whenever that project is done. And then east of 17th Street, those properties were assessed when we did 20th Street. So that's, that's how those assessment areas are determined. And then for 18th and 18 and a half street, only the front footing, the properties that actually directly front on those streets are proposed to be assessed. So the project financing based on the bids, this project has a total cost of about $538,000. Out of that, about 40% is being special assessed and then the remaining 60% is paid for by the city through the general tax levy. And this is just about where we expect projects like this to end up. The assessment policy, the goal for the policy is to make sure we're well above the 20% threshold so that we don't, have to have a, we don't have a problem in issuing a bond. And we want to keep the assessment low enough that it's not a burden on the property owners. And so generally we shoot for 30 to 40% is what the policy is intended to generate and that's what it does in this case. So as I noted, uh, the, there's 84 properties that are getting a secondary benefit only. And I apologize if this is a little confusing. I did these two presentations and I didn't make them completely the same the way this slide is presented. In this case, 84 properties only get the $500 assessment. There's actually 97, I think, that get that, but 13 of those are also getting primary benefit. So, if there's any confusion, I apologize for that. There's a total of 137 properties. Out of that, 53 get a front footage assessment, and, only, and 84 of them are only getting the secondary of $500. So uh, the project schedule, uh, this was, uh, we've been working towards this since January when the uh, capital improvement plan was adopted. We received bids on April 1st and the bids came in well. We're holding the hearing tonight. And for this project, since the hearing, we didn't have any issues with the hearing notice that went out. 
we were planning on having the council consider uh, ordering the improvements and awarding the bids after closing the hearing tonight. And then this project would get constructed this summer and under normal procedures, we'd hold the hearing this fall. And that's something that uh, you know, if the council had a concern about that, we can explore with the finance director uh, you know, how it would work if we wanted to have an alternate timeline for that. So, so that would be the close of my presentation. So if you have any questions. Hey, uh, <clears throat> thank you again, Mr. Trowbridge. Uh, Councilmember Hendrickson, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Couple questions for you, Tom. These, the PVC pipes, how long do those usually last? So, so you, the VCP is the vitrici vitrified clay pipe. And so that's typical of sanitary sewer installed before about 1970. And the pipe itself is actually very, very good. It lasts a long time. The real problem with it usually comes from the initial installation. Well, there's, there's two problems you get. There's a lot more joints, usually every three feet, which are the enemy of joints is tree roots because the sewers always have water in them and the trees like the water. So the roots grow into the joints and cause problems. And otherwise, at the time it's installed, sometimes it, it can be a brittle pipe and it can be cracked at that time, but it's remarkable how long pipe can be cracked and nothing happens to it. Um, it can, you can get some infiltration and inflow in those sewers as well. Um, but it's very, very simple to line those pipes with a liner that makes a seamless pipe, uh, adds extra strength to it. And so that's typically what we do. But this pipe, if you don't dig down and work next to it, it could last 100 or more years. Uh, if it was poorly installed to begin with, it could crack and collapse. You, you just don't know. PVC should last, you know, 75, 100 years without any concerns. And unless there's something unusual about the sewage, it shouldn't affect it. And this is normal domestic sewage in this area. So PVC should last a long time. With the water mains, the cast iron, uh, when they replace that with PVC again, they expect that to last 75, 100 years. And you stole my question, Tom. I was gonna ask if it was a cast iron. So yeah. it's good we're, we're getting rid of that yeah. in that area. And um, one more question for you. Grace United, did they give you a reason why they didn't want that sidewalk expanded? I wasn't at the meeting. Again, I would assume in this case it had more to do with, it, it was a maintenance issue and with the way their building was, they had plenty of off street parking. People used their parking lot. I, I think they looked at it as for the, for the cost of maintenance versus the benefit they had from it. They, they just, even though we weren't going to assess them to have it, they would have an ongoing maintenance cost. And I would, I would assume that's the case but I wasn't in on that meeting. I just know that they said they, they would just assume that we did not put the sidewalk in there. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentations, Tom. Very good, and uh, yeah. thanks for your time. Are there any uh, further uh, questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Madam City Planner, have we had any phone calls regarding this matter? Thank you, uh, Madam City Clerk. Done at this time. Uh, I do want to note, uh, just so the record can re reflect, uh, in advance to uh, this public uh, hearing, uh, the council did receive, I believe, two emails regarding this engineering project for this public hearing. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if, uh, Mr. City Attorney, if uh, having that we did receive these emails uh, from individual residents, uh, how do we make a record? Do we just make a record of who sent them? Do we have to read them into as a part of the public hearing record? How do we do that? So under the ordinance that uh, the council had adopted regarding the public hearings, uh, 
we're giving the public the maximum opportunity to provide the comments. So you'd have somebody from the city uh, read who sent the comments. Um, you could either summarize them or read them verbatim. It's up to the person reading them. If that's what we did the last hearing. We had the, the engineer summarize them along with the response to them, which is appropriate. He notes who made, who made the comment, where their address is, and then summarize the comments. And then that email is available if anybody wants verbatim. Okay. So, Mr. Trowbridge, would you feel comfortable doing yes. that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And so, I, and I believe the two emails, there, there, was, uh, there was some email exchange back and forth. It was one resident, I believe, specific to this project. And that was uh, Mr. Kukowski. Um, he owns a property that he manages there, an apartment property that is affected by the special assessment. And his email, his first concern really that he raised was with the process, the public hearing process that with the COVID-19 going on, it wasn't open and that he was concerned about opportunity. We explained the policy, how that works. And I, I think he understood that anyway with his opportunities to comment and uh, and then, then specific to the project, he didn't raise any issues really with whether the project was necessary. His primary issue that he, wrote, uh, that he raised was this wasn't the time to do it due to economic concerns, uh, people's ability to pay the special assessment. And so he had a strong recommendation that the project should be delayed at least one year. So basically he said one or more years. And, you know, and he had some other comments just generally regarding uh, taxes and, and assessments in general. He was, he raised issue with the, uh, the interest that we had listed in the notice. We, we had a 5.25% interest that we listed in there. And I explained that, you know, that's just a ballpark number. It's actually not you know, the, the actual interest gets set at the time the assessment is adopted and it will be based on the actual general obligation bond. And at this time, we just don't know what that would be, although we acknowledge that it probably will be lower than that 5.25% that we'd put in there. And then uh, he had some questions about bidding. He wasn't sure if we knew the numbers yet, and of course, even now, it's still an estimate, even though we have received the bids, it's still an estimate because there's a possibility of change orders. Our estimate includes what we think are the likely project costs, and we certainly hope it's possible the project could come in lower. We certainly hope it wouldn't go in any higher, but we've got some numbers that we factor into that. And um, so he was, he, wasn't, he was wondering whether the timing we received the bids was good or not, and we figure any time between February and May is a good time to receive bids. And so this, we, we think the bids, based on the review, the bids were good, and we're very confident that, uh, that we got good bids for it, and it was uh, you know, a, a, a well-designed project that way. And then he had some concerns generally just about trust because he's, He's watching the underpass project and is concerned how that relates to this. And our answer on that is it's, it's they're very different projects. These road projects are very simple. Uh, you know, we're very confident that any issues we've had on the underpass project won't appear on this one. So the projects will get done on time. Uh, they should be on budget. Uh, there really aren't surprises because, again, we've received the bid, so we, we know what what we have at this point. And, and then he had, and I think it was just some questions on what was being proposed and we answered those. And I, I didn't see any follow-up questions, so I think he understands what we're proposing to do. And he didn't seem to raise any objections to what was being done. Primarily, he's just urging that we delay the projects for economic reasons. Okay. Uh, thank you for that summation. Uh, Councilmember Selgevold, did you have any uh, questions or anything to add? Okay, I just want to make sure uh, because of the hand, uh, the, the lack of the hand uh, icon. 
Uh, Council member, Hen okay, and yours just went away. All right, I just want to make sure <laughs> I'm not missing anybody. Um, okay, and then uh, it's, again, just looking at your presentation, it's your uh, request and tonight, uh, our city staff, that uh, we consider the resolution unlike the last yes. public hearing. Yes. Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, does that bring about any other questions or comments from council? Seeing, hearing none, then uh, we'll have a motion to uh, close the public hearing on this item. So moved, Jeff White. Linda, second. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Madam City Clerk. Steve Lindos. Yes. Chuck Hendrickson. Yes. Larry Seljabold. Yes. Deb White. Yes. Heidi Durand. Yes. Shelley Carlson. Yes. Sarah Watson Curry. Yes. Shelley Dahlquist. Yes. Motion carries. We are out of public hearing. And then uh, there's 11A and B for resolutions. Is there a motion to? I move to approve both. Watson Curry, second. And just to make sure, Mr. City Attorney, we can do both of these at the same time? Correct. This is for item A and B. Madam City Clerk, you have the motion and the second. Can you just repeat who first? Who I gave the first? It was Council Member White first. Council Member Watson Curry with the second. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shelley Dahlquist? Yes. Sarah Watson Curry? Yes. Shelley Carlson? Yes. Heidi Durand? Yes. Steve Lindos? Yes. Larry Seljavold? Yes. Chuck Hendrickson? Yes. And Deb White? Yes. Motion uh, carries. And uh, I'm not sure, and I'll, uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, before we go on to the next item, I just want to make sure. I just <clears throat> made a note here that we did receive one uh, email item in regards to the public hearing uh, item number 10. Uh, would it be appropriate to get a summation of that email at this time, or can we wait till? because that one's open until the 27th. We can wait till the 27th for that one. Okay, just let the record reflect. We did receive uh, an email and I apologize to everyone uh, that there was an email that came in from uh, Mr. Beckeris regarding the item on the agenda for the public hearing with the engineering number 20-A2-01A which is uh, marked as number 10 on tonight's agenda, but we will bring that up again on the 27th. And again, that email is available to the public and the response, if, we want, if anyone wishes to read it prior to the next hearing. Then with that, we'll move to, I believe, item number 19, which are mayor and council reports. Are there any uh, reports that the uh, council member wishes to make this evening? I see council member White will let you go first and then council member Carlson thereafter. I just wanted to um, thank our one of our staff members, Christina Frost, for the work she's doing on putting together some plans and uh, timeline and uh, for how we do council or how we do appointments to boards and commissions. And so a few of us were able to sit in on a meeting this week and with other city staff and sort of flesh out some of those ideas so we can have a, a clearer, more efficient process for picking people for our boards and commissions. So I wanted to put that out there and thank her for her work. Thank you. And then uh, Council Member uh, Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have some news from the Moorhead Public Library. Um, starting this week, uh, the Moorhead Public Library is going to start no contact curbside service to Moorhead Library customers. Um, and what this 
Um, the reason that they're offering the service is based on the statement issued by the Minnesota Department of Education that based on a review of Executive Order 20.20 MDE has determined that public library services may be deemed essential during the COVID-19 pandemic and within the library's ability to provide for social distancing and the regular disinfecting and sanitation of library materials and to follow Minnesota Department of Health and Centers for Disease Control Health and Safety Protocols, it may remain open to provide distance online digital virtual services and no contact curbside pickup of materials. So again, starting this week, they're going to be able to do that. They'll sanitize items, bag them up, and drop them on the hood of the customer's car in the parking lot. Um, this does not mean that customers will be allowed into the buildings, but it does mean that you are able to check out things. Um, also, if you did not want to do that, they are still issuing library cards and they're actually um, issued over 160 new library cards um, since the whole COVID-19 has started. And what that library card allows you to do is access eBooks and e-audio collections. Also, the library has signed up for a contract with Hoopla, which is like a Netflix for libraries. So again, this is going to be really helpful and beneficial um, for Moorhead citizens and other individuals who get a library card. Um, you're gonna be able to download eBooks, e-audiobooks, movies, comic books, and music. And this is gonna be starting next week for the Hoopla. Again, that's like a Netflix for libraries. Um, also good news is that the library or the Lake Agassi Regional Library purchased, um, received a grant to purchase $7,400 in Wi-Fi hotspots um, so that customers can utilize that. And this program will run for three months. And um, once the library gets the hotspots, they will start setting them up. So just to be on the lookout that that will start in the next few weeks. Lastly, what I want to highlight is that the library staff has added a new hotline service. And again, I think this is very important um, that library staff around the region are able to answer reference and account questions from the safety of your own home. Um, questions about the census, questions about tax forms, um, genealogy, customer account, and technology assistance, which I think is also very important for individuals who we do have some of those tech questions, but um, maybe don't really quite know where to go to or respond to. Um, and then speaking of tech, I just wanted to give a shout out to um, Christopher Raddy, who is our IT development or IT director for the city of Moorhead, who I'm sure has been working an incredible amount of overtime and having to really step up him and his staff. And I know that he's down a staff member in his department and the amount of work that uh, Mr. Raddy is doing and, and the IT staff of the city is just above and beyond and just incredible. So I just wanna give a shout out of gratefulness and appreciation for asking. I know I have had some very probably non techie techie questions that you have assisted me with um, and to continually provide that with the patience and kindness and, and, uh, and never questioning our abilities even though I'm sure you do inside. Uh, I just wanted to really say thank you. That's, that's uh, all, Mr. Mayor, thank you. No problem, thank you. And that's uh, that shout out's definitely duly noted uh, for uh, Chris Raddy and the IT staff. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Council Member Durand. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had just received a, a couple emails uh, from some residents that are concerned about uh, people improperly disposing of items that normally would have been um, normally would have been put on a curb for spring cleanup. So with students leaving and not having the spring cleanup option, um, there's some people who are concerned that our ditches might be uh, polluted with all kinds of um, things like mattresses and and who knows what else. Um, so I, I just want to bring that to to make sure that our city staff is aware of that and maybe we can work with the county to uh, you know keep some of our off roads uh, litter free thank and you thank you uh, councilmember duran for bringing that up up uh, and so that the public is uh 
noted uh, for that as well, that we'll have to kind of look after each other and make sure that uh, if we see any issues of that nature, to please let the uh, city staff know as soon as possible. Uh, I see Councilmember Lindas. Thank you, Mayor Judd. Um, I was just going to say that um, people should be aware as, as the weather warms up and it becomes um, uh, uh, more uh, um, equitable to go play outside, that playgrounds should be closed. Um, and that, that the reason for that is essentially the COVID-19 virus can last from anywhere from a few hours of copper service to a few days, like three to, three to almost seven days if it's a painted or plastic surface. And so people should um, act like they might have the, the virus and, and so don't play in equipment and leave it around for others to track. Um, and I know most people, if they understand that, um, will uh, act accordingly. Otherwise, enjoy as the weather starts um, getting nice. Um, walk, but, um, and I've, I've been noticing people have actually been doing a really nice job of, of separating and, and saying hi from a distance. So uh, certainly get out, um, enjoy the weather, but um, keep social distance. Thank you, Council Member Lindas, uh, for that. Uh, is any other council member wishes to speak? I guess I'll piggyback on uh, Council Member Lindos's uh, <clears throat> uh, comment. Uh, I have been going on uh, Saturday walks uh, throughout the, uh, the uh, city. I have a accountability uh, partner that walks with me. <laughs> and I think somebody on social media was uh, commenting <clears throat> to make sure that we're maintaining our social distancing. And I will tell you this person's in a lot better shape than I am, and uh, he walks He's taller than I am and has longer strides than I am, and I think he has me by 60 to 80 feet. So just know that if you see me walking in your neighborhood with a few people, there's good, there is appropriate social distancing in place just by the physical nature of our stature. So <laughs> uh, we'll keep on doing that uh, every Saturday. So you might see me walking around. Feel free to come out the door and say hello from a distance, and I'll say hello back. Uh, also with that, uh, I wanted to send a, a special shout out uh, to uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar um, and her staff, as well as uh, our city staff, our city manager, Christina Volkers, Downtown Moorhead, Inc., uh, Derek LaPointe, Executive Director. Uh, we had a phone call uh, last week where uh, she gave an update on the federal uh, legislation that has been coming down. I know that uh, uh, Derek LaPointe has been uh, talking with uh, Minnesota Deed and also e economic uh, development experts out of St. Paul for a, a call virtually every morning, uh, giving an update on uh, what's going on in St. Paul and how that's gonna help us in greater Minnesota. So kudos for, to him for doing that. Also for uh, uh, City Manager Volkers also helping uh, to have help me develop the asks uh, for uh, Senator Klobuchar as what we need from a public health perspective, but also from an economic development and recovery uh, standpoint. And so there's a lot that we were able to share with Senator Amy and her staff uh, that uh, she and her staff made uh, many notes on uh, because obviously with the dynamics that we have, not only being a city in greater Minnesota, but also being a border city, uh, we have certain dynamics that are different than most cities. So. Uh, thanks to her for spending all the time uh, uh, listening to us uh, make our asks and also hopefully with the uh, intent that she'll do what she can in D.C. along with our Minnesota contingent uh, to make those things happen. So uh, again, shout out to a lot of folks in that area. Uh, also, <clears throat> shout outs to the mayors of Dilworth, Glendon, Barnesville, and Holly. Uh, we checked in with each other uh, last Friday afternoon, had a really, really good conversation, uh, check in to see how we're doing in Moorhead, but also a check in to make sure uh, to see that things are going well in those jurisdictions as well, uh, and making sure that uh, people are being you know, taken care of, and also making sure that if there's any gaps that we need to fill uh, as a region, but also things that we need to uh, communicate to Governor Walz, as well as uh, the legislature, 
and also for uh, Senator Amy in DC and Senator Smith. Uh, it was good to check in with those folks and make sure things are going well with uh, the residents as well as the businesses uh, in those areas. And I think looking at that, make sure I'm not missing anybody or anything. Oh, one other thing I will say. Uh, so every uh, Monday, uh, we have city and county representatives meeting on a task force, and this is the Community COVID-19 Task Force with our public health partners, uh, with Sanford and Essentia, along with our uh, education uh, folks from the public schools, uh, uh, districts uh, throughout the region. And <clears throat> just so folks know that, uh, you know, we're, we, the public health uh, folks are still in planning right now for a surge in uh, COVID-19 positive tests. Uh, I want to give a shout out to those folks, the Sanford and Essentia, for being really in the know, watching, reading, and listening to what's going on with the uh, trends. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that, uh, you know, if you're looking at, based on what they're following right now, we might be looking at a surge that might go into the best case scenario, June. Uh, worst case scenario for our region, maybe July. So I want to send a shout out to those folks for keeping us all educated and in the know about what's going on. But also kudos to all the residents. Uh, through my long walks that I've been taking around town, I've only seen one particular concern. There were a group of youth playing basketball um, over by the, uh, uh, is it a town? Uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of it. Town site center. Yep. Yes. I saw them too. Yes, you saw them too. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member White. So again, uh, we're just urging folks, please, please, please stay away from the parks. I know it's, it was a nice day here a few days ago. Please stay away from the parks, off the equipment. And again, we're asking for those neighborhood parents to come out and uh, call those kids out and get them away from there so we can, uh, uh, again, flatten that curve. So other than that, that's all that I have. And I will pass it over to Madam City Manager, Christina Volkers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have two, ish two things to report on. The first is um, per council policies, um, if the city wants to give away something or reduce the cost of something, I am allowed the authority to approve that, but I do need to report to the council at the next council meeting. So one thing I do want to report on is a census update. We've been working really hard um, getting everybody to fill out their census and we're doing pretty good actually. We're at about 50% of our citizens who have filled out the census, so that's good. We need to get to 100% that does help with all kinds of things, um, federal and state funding being um, one of the most important things. So we encourage everybody to fill out their census that they live in Moorhead. But um, one of the ways that we're, um, you know, kind of playing for, for competition to get people to do that, to fill out their census, is that we've got a census ward challenge going on, and I've authorized an additional three golf passes as incentives to the people who are working on this very important initiative, um, which who knows when the golf courses are gonna open, but assuming they open soon, um, this is not a, a, a gift or a, a prize that I've authorized. So I just wanna report on that to the council. So that's number one. The second thing is I wanted to give you a really um, high level financial outlook because I'm beginning to get concerned as you all are about the economic downturn that's that's coming due to COVID-19. I wanna kind of give you a snapshot of where, where the city is at right now. This is gonna change and it will could change by the day, but for right now, I wanna give you a um, snapshot of our financial outlook. As you know, the general fund requires a fund balance of at least 40% and up to 60. We do try to strive for 60% in our fund balance. Um, if and we are a little below 60 or we're at the year end 2019. 
um, we could go down to 40. If we go down to 40, there is a policy that says that we must um, um, we must have a plan to bring it up to 60 again over a period of time. But right now we're a little bit before, or a little bit less than 60, could go down to 40. I wanted to report if we were gonna do that, we could use up to $6 million in reserves if we had to in an emergency before we go triggering um, you know, our bond rating and everything else if we have a plan to go up. So that, that's an important number to keep in mind. Uh, property tax revenue reductions would require also the use of reserves. If we just estimate at a 15%, which is what my colleagues are talking about statewide and nationwide, possible 15% reduction in overall collections of property taxes, that is a $2.3 million number. And that does account for one third, property tax revenues account for one third of our general fund revenues. So that is a very key part of our um, operations which go to support public safety and, um, and, and basic operations for the city. Um, property tax reductions would also require the use of reserves and for the debt service funds, debt service payments for 2020 could be covered by current reserves but our cash balance would not cover 2021 debt service payments. That's a significant issue that could be looming um, if we don't have receipt of the property tax and special assessment payments in full. So those are some things we're looking at. Other significant revenue shortfalls are anticipated in um, specifically right now Parks and Rec, Helen Hockey Center. We're already seeing a huge decline in uh, rentals. And then in addition, we're a little worried about our utility funds due to non-payment delays and payments, for example, for wastewater, stormwater, sanitation, forestry, pest control, and street lights. We will use reserve balances to help make up for that temporarily, but we are required to keep at least 25% in each of those utility funds and we're close in some of those areas because we have not been raising fees for the last several years. So that is, um, that is a concern and the potential write-off by our collector for utility non-payment. So we do need to watch that closely. We're right on the edge of that. Fund balance policy, as I said, does state when the unrestricted general fund balance is projected to drop below 40%, we shall initiate measures to get it up immediately and up to 60% over a period of years. So can you please keep that in mind. The last thing that we are really working on is cash flow projections for operating scenarios um, that we're, they're being developed. We're working hard on getting those um, together so we can start planning to assist for the planning if this continues for six months, this current emergency situation or 18 months. We hope that neither of those are true, but six months is a, is a potential. So we are coming up with our, um, with our financial plan on, on how to deal with that including service changes, um, expense reductions, um, hiring freezes, et cetera. So we are coming up with some scenarios on that. You'll hear more about that later. So with that, I'll take any questions. That's a high level. I don't know any details yet, but I wanted to assure the council that we are very um, diligently working on our financial projections. Thank you uh, for that uh, report, uh, Madam City Manager, and uh, and it's good for us to know that information because I know that the current uh, environment not only affects uh, businesses, but it does affect municipalities, families, and everyone equally. So, I mean, we have to be on, on top of that. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, questions or comments from our uh, City Manager Volkers? Okay. Uh, hearing seeing none, then uh, we'll move on to item number 21, no executive session. <clears throat> item 22, no new business. And then uh, for item number 23, I will uh, ask, I have not received any communication myself. Um, Madam City Planner, have we had any communication uh, call-ins regarding citizens wishing to address the council? <laughs> Madam City Clerk, any electronic communications on your end? None at this time. And seeing none, that will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved, Deb White. Second, Dahlquist. 
and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and good night, Morgan. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Y'all take care. Stay safe. Stay safe.